Jai Guru, everyone. Jai Guru. Hello and welcome to the Yogananda podcast. We're on chapter four and the last part of chapter four, part six today. I'm with Chris and Lauren and also Niriksha again. Mike is off gallivanting in some lovely part of Italy, I imagine, right now. Um, but Niriksha is back with us, thankfully. How's Niriksha doing? Nariksha's good. She's pretty glad to be here. I don't know why I responded to the third person, but... Um. <laughs> um, Nick, tell us about... We, I was so rude last time. We didn't actually tell ask you anything about your experiences of the autobiography of a yogi. Oh, so that's the that's the question now. It's an okay. open. It's an open <laughs> okay. book question. You can pick um, any page of the book of Nirikshya. Uh, oh my gosh, it's my experience with the A A Y. It's very strange. I was introduced to it when I was a kid, like eight, and it's kind of like my relationship with it has changed. I've never read the book cover to cover. I've listened to the book. <laughs> on like road trips and my mom would read me like a chunk so bits and pieces and um it's interesting you know sometimes I feel like an imposter because like you know I read bits and pieces and I know enough to talk about it but I was like should I be on these things I've not read this cover to cover you know so I just like sit there like um but here's the thing I feel like the AY is so intense that you may not sometimes it's not for everybody to sit down and read cover to cover because like if you I'm going to branch off for like two seconds because the works of Yogananda have been so comprehensive with all of his books it's like if you get the message you get the message he has all these he has all his mediums but I'd say the AY is a special one because it's kind of like a movie on its own I know some people have read it cover to cover several times over I think when I my guilt yeah Frank definitely has my my uh, initial guilt uh, Nariksha was that I'd only read it once so you know there's there's definitely people that you know go to at the, and then to agree with it which is fantastic I I love that um, I've got a lot of time for that but like I said there's so much material in Yogananda's um, uh, yeah it, it, that that is produced in with SRF we've talked about many times actually just opening the book and there you have exactly the bit of information that you need at that time and it's yes. just coincidental right it's just quite you know you happen to go into a service and they talk about something you know in, maybe in a lesson or something at that time that's just right for you at that time so yes. yeah being open to the messages they'll come they'll come whenever but I, I do yeah. have a question um who, who introduced you to the book when you were eight years old my mom I want to see my mom she was like hey this is really cool it's interesting we did not call him Guruji at the time we used to follow a different guru and um, we would call him grandpa and then um, Guruji was the American grandpa um, I was like okay we're gonna reach our American grandpa today and I was like okay so it's interesting. I've had a very familiar relationship with the guru ever since I was a kid. So it's interesting to see that grow with me. Did an eight-year-old New Yorkshire think this American grandpa looks awfully of Indian origin, awfully a lot? <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, this is about India. Why are we calling him American grandpa? And he's like, oh, because you know he did this in American. I was like, huh. So. <laughs> And Nyuksha is so Generation Z, isn't she? Gen Z, calling gurus American grandpas and uh, not reading books well, cover to cover, just listening to them and dipping in well, and out. You audio know. Well, get... Two speed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Two speed. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty cool. Um, that's nice, Nyuksha. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get into the topic. So the last, this is the last section of chapter four, as we said. And here Swami um, Shastri Mahashaya, Swami Kebadananda, uh, relates more pastimes of Lady Mahashaya, which is very nice. And he relates a beautiful miracle that he 
observed or he was party to had a little part to play in shall we say um and we're gonna go through that um i will also go through the um the footnotes actually the footnotes are quite nice in this section there's there's references to sanskrit terms such as ahamkara and there's lots of passages from the bhagavad gita and other things so that should cover us hopefully in uh, 60 minutes or less ambitious uh let's start with <laughs> <laughs> i'm over over promising on again <laughs> <laughs> um so we uh let's talk about the first paragraph in this section the first paragraph says essentially talks about the christ-like miracles uh, that uh, lady marshai performed in uh, sashti marshai's presence and he calls them christ-like miracles now this is this is a very popular word that paramahansa yogananda uses um, and it got me to thinking how often he uses it and why he uses it. So he, I did a search of Christ-like in uh, Autobiography of Yogi, and it's 13 times mentioned. But then if you think of other words like Yogi Christ and things like that, then it's, you know, many more fold. You can't, you probably can't uh, count. Um, but uh I was thinking, firstly, well, if if this is Christ-like, then what would Krishna-like be? Krishna-like. Mm. His uh, miracles are much more uh, grandiose, usually, you know. But Chris, what do you think? When I when I think about Christ, of course, Jesus Christ comes to the fore of your mind. But I actually think now more just about the Christ consciousness itself. So whenever I hear this reference, I actually don't think necessarily about Jesus as much as I do about the manifestation of Christ consciousness through individuals. And I thought that that's sort of what Yogananda is referring to. That's what how I associate it, as mm. opposed to a reference to Jesus, even though he does reference Jesus a lot, which is which is great, you know, um, and the teachings of Jesus and what what he what he stood for and everything. But I'm not sure is it actually referring to Jesus as such, as opposed to Christ consciousness itself. There's a multifold, actually. So you're, I think you're right, mostly, because he also, as a synonym, he sometimes says Krishna, you know, Krishna consciousness or cosmic mm -hmm. consciousness, and uses these kind of things, terms, interchangeably. But um, there's, there's Jesus the man and Jesus the Christ, and there's Krishna the Yadava, Krishna, the avatar, right? Um, yeah, Lauren? Following on from that also, I think we have to remember where he published this book and for what audience it was for, and it was for Westerners, right, initially. So the American could relate to Christ probably more than Krishna, whereas they are the same consciousness because they are God. So it's the same. It's just the type of language I think that she used um, and what that brings up, you know, when someone says Christ-like, I think, I think of Christ and I think of the love and the healing and how God poured through that expression. Um, but yeah, I think it's probably a language thing as well. Hmm. The Yogi Christ that I mentioned previously is uh, in reference to Babaji. Um, and then Christ-like he actually uses this in the first paragraph of the book, and he's obviously referring to Lahi, um, Swami Sri Yukteswara. You know, he's referred to him as a Christ-like sage that he was uh, introduced to. And then there's also in the chapter, The Christ-like Life of Lady Mahasaya, which is where we are today. But here he's saying a Christ-like miracle. So I thought I'd go through the various miracles that Christ... Uh, performed and ones which are most similar to the ones that I've talked about in the autobiography um, and I found an interesting article on <clears throat> in the BBC about the miracles of Christ um, and I'll put that on the link but uh, one of them was uh, the healing the raising of the widow's son um, and that is interesting because it, later on in the book we 
No Lehi Masha in chapter 32, um, says, which is entitled Rama is raised from the dead. Um, and in there it's Rama. And in this chapter, we're going to talk about the miracle whose name is Ramu. But uh, Ram is a very common name in India. Could be two different people, but interesting. It would be interesting if it was the same person, but we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Um, the other miracles are the feeding of the five. Yeah, Chris? I I'm probably going to put my foot in it here, but, uh, you know, why not? Um, Ram, I thought this was to do with the worshipping of the Ram at the time of Moses, which they worshipped the Ram. Being... Or Ram as in random access memory or something else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Computers. <laughs> The time of the Pis Pisces and the time of, you know, the, the time of for ast astrology. Um, I thought it was to do with that more than anything else. Uh, is, is it the same here or is it different? No, in, in this in this case, it's very, um, very obviously talking about Ram, the incarnation of Vishnu that was pre before Krishna, essentially. So he's one of the nine avatars of Vishnu and one of the most uh, famous uh, one uh, the epic ramayan is about him and his life um, so he's talking about uh, the incarnation of god as ram um, but uh, interesting parallel yeah, every day <laughs> it's a big epic book that one not as big as the mahabharata but uh, you could talk about it in the same breath but uh, the other miracles are uh, the feeding of the 5,000, the healing of the paralyzed man. Now, this one is very apt and very much related to uh, Ramu's healing here in uh, that we're going to talk about later in terms of his blindness. Um, then there's the stilling of the storm. And then there's also the resurrection, of course, the most famous. But in the autobiography, we have the resurrection of Sri Yukteswar, which is uh, obviously one of the best chapters in the book, in my opinion, chapter 43. So uh, there's that. So in Discourse 20, from the second coming of Christ, um, we have a very good explanation of this um, healing of the paralyzed man. And uh, I thought we'd read it today because it sets a beautiful context for, for what has happened here with Lady Mahasha and Ramu. So do you want to start? So the, the discourse is, is, is entitled uh, Thy Son Liveth, um, and it's the healing power of thought transformation. Uh, Lauren, do you want to start us off with a reading? So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down near, my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. That's from John 4, 45 to 50. Chris, do you want to explain or read what Yogananda described? Sure. Part of Jesus' mission was to make visible God's healing mercy. Through his public miracles, Jesus demonstrated that even incurable diseases and insoluble problems can be surmounted, sometimes instantly, by attunement with divine will. The purpose of these miracle healings, miraculous healings, was not to glorify the perishable body, but to rouse faith in the omnipresence of God and in man's innate ability to contact and personally know his heavenly father. Jesus knew what worldly mentalities have, that worldly mentalities have difficulty accepting their personal access to the merciful omnipotence. Thus, when asked by the nobleman to heal his son, who was dying at Caper Capernaum, Jesus observed wryly, except ye signs 
and it wanders ye not believe it was a gentle rebuke you are loath to believe in god's message you're loath to believe in god's me message of salvation sent through me unless he first demonstrates his presence in me by a display of miracles that benefits primarily your temporal needs nick would you like to continue I have to recover from that passage. <laughs> um, okay. God should not have to prove himself through miracles to earn the love and trust of his children. Each one, through his own free will and perfect accord, should make a voluntary choice of the heart to love God and to seek to know him. In the wisdom of a master, one should recognize the divine presence and be inspired towards God realization without the impetus of supernatural demonstrations. Nevertheless, seeking that the nobleman's faith was sincere, Jesus sympathetically told him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. These few words supported neither by the persuasive eloquence nor obvious evidence were yet sufficient to satisfy the nobleman. He could sense the divine vibration of healing power in Jesus. Thus, he believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Very powerful. And this kind of explains what we what we, you're going to meant by Christ-like miracles in this in this section and also explains why jesus and our gurus did feel the need to perform these miracles um you could you could call them gross miracles because they relate to um you know life and death or healing but not necessarily to the subtle aspect which is to your liberation so um it's kind of a different category if you catch my drift um but i thought that was a really good good parable actually from from uh, the second coming of christ for those who are yet to read it i'd highly recommend it i'm still chugging my way through it like nirikshya does <laughs> um so then we have so then um he relates uh he relates the the story essentially um but he looks away from the remote sanskrit texts guruji looks away from those he that uh, so the, the pretext was obviously that they was teaching uh, shastri masha was teaching him sanskrit and then this story kind of just came out <laughs> and uh, it was quite a nice story for young kunda but uh, swami kevlananda described it and he essentially said there was a blind disciple whose name was Ramu, and uh, you know he was uh, he aroused his active pity. He says, um, "This is an interesting word, active pity, for me. Uh, it's not one two words that you put together, really. Active pity, <laughs> pity is uh, not 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 a word that's used very often in the positive context, um, but here it's active pity. So he's made it into a positive." context and there's um, i get tones of uh, like the importance of sympathy and goodwill there and it kind of goes back to also my favorite affirmation which is as i radiate sympathy and goodwill to others i open the channels for god's love to come to me divine love is the magnet that attracts all blessedness which is really important for me that one but i got the feeling that uh, that's what i was read actually when i read those two words um so then he goes on and he says um he essentially says should he have no light in his eyes when he faithfully served our master in whom the divine was fully blazing what a wonderful way to describe <laughs> um Lady Marsha. i think Lady Marsha has probably been described in the most beautiful language isn't he out of all the gurus and gods in in the in the book all the masters and even in compared to his parents and siblings and other loved ones in america i think he reserved his most romantic uh, 
spiritual language for Elohim Hashem, or from his memory. Um, so he says again, should he have no light in his eyes when he faithfully served our master in whom the divine was fully blazing? So he asked that question to himself and he then spoke to Ramu, but um, he was he wanted to speak to Ramu, but Ramu was busy patiently fanning the guru with a homemade palm leaf bunker, which is a fan, uh, which is quite nice. Um, which also, um, I, I, it's quite a simple way to serve a guru to fan to fan uh, to fan him, but I think. Uh, Simple does not necessarily does not necessarily mean that it's not significant. Um, I know, like there's so many mundane tasks at the center, and they're, they're all you know they all make up the whole, which is which is uh, you know it's such a, a lovely, clean, um, you know, devotional atmosphere that that you experience when you go to the center. Um, and I just recall um, uh, someone from the center. Uh, but some people were thanking her for this very small, uh, actually, were a very big thing that she was doing um, on on WhatsApp. And then she responded just today with, um, "As you know, it is such a blessing to serve Guruji, and if it helps a little, great." And I thought, what a what a lovely attitude, isn't it? Even the, you know, even even those who are serving in really like important work for the Guru can see it as actually just a little thing and uh, and it doesn't matter whether or not it helps if it does then great it's such a wonderful attitude chris yeah i think you're right highlighting this because i remember when i first read this chapter in this part i remember being struck by this that someone would sit there and fan another person and i couldn't really tell you why but now that we're talking about it in a little bit more minute detail um it's as guruji says about meditation you know do it with intensity and focus and concentration and build up over time you know don't, don't sit there and try to do two hours at once if you're you know build this up over time it's all about the intention and the thought behind it and it strikes me that this is the same he's probably sitting in sheer devotion and love and this outpouring of you know affection and commitment and as we're about to hear in the story, he could be, you know, really intensely meditating, you know, maybe chanting, doing mantra at the same time. So it's quite possibly immensely beneficial, you know, he's maybe multitasking and doing different things. But it just struck me as a bit of a funny way to spend your time in, in the presence of a master or something like that, you know, when I first read it subconsciously. But um, yeah, it's such a great sign of devotion, isn't it? And, hugely beneficial i'm sure for for uh, for the one doing it and i'm sure some listeners some readers would read that and kind of be disgusted by that in a way why why is um why is someone fanning like in this almost like like a master and servant but there's not master and servant; it's a master and devotee why is someone putting, putting on such a great pedestal and why is someone fanning there's such a belittling um activity and I, I must i must admit if if i'd saw this like uh you know the, every, today's royalty if i saw the king or the queen being fanned by whatever his or her subjects i would have had the same feeling but i dare say lahiri mahasha did not need fanning he was probably in full control of his uh temperature shall we say if he was able to perform the miracles that he does perform and he does not need fanning but did ramu need to do the farming fanning that's the key um because you know we're talking about here he's he's um it's not you know it's not prudent to talk about anyone specific uh fortunes and misfortunes it's not a good thing to do but um ramu is obviously being born here with the misfortune of not being able to see and he has he has somewhat of a longing to to be able to see otherwise he wouldn't have gone down this path but we call it a misfortune but um is it a misfortune you know sometimes um curses can you know some things can that can seem bad can be a blessing can't they lauren mm, 
I've been pondering on this for a while because I work at a school for blind children mm-hmm. and I ponder on them because sometimes it feels that it's a blessing you know when, when we look around it, it, it is a blessing to see but it's easier to get drawn into the material plane whereas if you do not have sight of the material plane I wonder could that be of, of spiritual benefit to some people if they're able to uh, perceive it in that way <laughs> only god knows <laughs> <laughs> and similarly with other disabilities yeah. that are like like deaf being deaf um you know you you're then one of your five sense telephones is disconnected <laughs> so that one telephone can't um mm. can't distract you um and uh, yeah chris i have thought about this before um and i've heard that everything is a blessing it's just that through our ignorance and sort of clouded judgment and ego and everything like we don't quite see it and it's also a bit of a hard pill to swallow if that is true because there's so much suffering and perceived injustice and things like this in the world and people say why you know they're good people things things like that so it is a very difficult thing to try to wrap your head around but in essence every single thing as i understand it is a blessing we just through our lack of understanding can't see it that way um it's kind of a sensitive topic in some ways right that you depend on who, who you're talking to of course but um I, I i'd agree with you it's in this sense um somebody's laser focused on what might be important to them and not as distracted um by, by all the distractions in the world nick i was gonna say something similar but honestly i'm glad you shared that um chris and lauren because it makes me want to say that I feel like we, you know, if if, if we if we see in the, in the perspective of like a soul like getting an incarnation, it's like a part of us made a choice to live a life like this and receive the divine through everything, right? So it's, I feel like if we look at it that perspective, um, half of the questions that we are, the agony that we have would be eliminated. Maybe I don't, I'm just, throwing out a perspective you know it's like when you know because when I was a kid I I had trouble learning and then at first I was like oh my gosh I'm like slower than all these kids but then um the teacher would always call me to do all like the creative fun projects and I was like hmm, maybe this isn't so bad after all it's probably because my mind works differently so so it makes you feel less bad when you try to you know take responsibility and accept that everything in your life including like stuff that's not so fun you you chose it but again this is sensitive and it may ruffle some feathers so mm. well some sometimes we even choose to uh temporarily undergo some of these states like when we have silent retreats or when we insist on uh silence during meditation is essentially like manufacturing some of these states that people are going through full time but um but Amu obviously we, we talked about his needing to fan the guru there when I when I when I say need I meant on the on the level of um, the karma that he needed to relinquish um and the opportunity that he's got to do that and obviously that's beyond the scope of our limited understanding of what that scope is but um sister Gyanamata um you know, she was Guru, one of Guruji's most advanced disciples. And, you know, they, they they say she suffered a lot, a lot in her health. And she was in, you know, a lot of pain through her life, um, especially in the latter stages. And she was obviously very blessed, but she was undergoing all these physical problems, just one after the other. And uh, the saints around her, or, the you know, the other monks around her asked uh, Guruji, why why is she if she's this elevated why is she going through so much suffering and guruji said she essentially she asked you know before taking this birth she asked me you know i want to i want to this to be my last life essentially i, I want to overcome all my hurdles and my my baggage and hence she chose to undergo these these um 
problem that she did and that's really a message for all of us whether whether or not we know it we chose to be exactly where we are so that's uh, food food for thought um but let's continue with the story um so he swami um Kevlananda, or he would have been Shastri Mahashai at that time. He, you know, he was observing this um, devotee fanning, fanning Lady Mahashai, and then he waited, he waited, and then uh, he waited for him to finally leave the room and followed him, and asked him, "How long have you been blind?" And he said, "From birth." And Ramu said, "I, you know, these eyes have never has, these eyes have never been blessed with a glimpse of the sun." And uh, it is a blessing, isn't it? <laughs> Whether or not we we can or can't see it. If we can see it, it's a blessing, um, which is quite a nice way to say it. Our And then Shasti Mahasaya says, our guru can help you. Why don't you essentially ask him? And Ramu then diffidently, he says, approached Lady Mahasaya and indiffidently and also ashamedly almost to ask that physical wealth be added to his spiritual superabundance so this kind of uh, really highlights the um the kind of the state that we should aspire to be where he's he, he's acknowledging that he's got so much right and to ask uh to ask for more maybe mundane but you are coming from a position where you you're realizing how much blessings and grace you have in your life even though you know he's blind he's saying these words chris yeah when i read this it struck me of a question of gratitude it's almost like one would negate the other like oh i'm going to ask for something and i think thereby that mean that would mean that I almost don't have, or that if I have that thing, I maybe lose the ability to connect with all things. Does that begin, begin to make sense in some way? Um, and you maybe lose gratitude for that which you have, or it diminishes the gratitude, you know, that, that for, for for that which you have for for something else. But I think if anything, we're learning that you can have an abundance of gratitude. It's it's never limited. Um, that that's what I thought whenever I first read this. It's your your worries, you're kind of feeling guilty that okay, does this mean I'm less grateful for something if if I if I demand something else? Because mm. we know that um physical abundance, um, material abundance doesn't necessarily equate to spiritual, you know, abundance in any way, really. It just means that some things are taken care of, but then often means that you have a hundred times more <laughs> worries and problems than someone that didn't have all those things. Um, so rich man <laughs> doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily rich spiritually, well he can be so. Um, so then um, he says uh, he says beautifully, you know, he refers to the Ramu refers to Lehi Masha and says. The illuminator, the illuminator of the cosmos is in you. I pray to bring, I pray you to bring his light into my eyes that I perceive the sun's lesser glow. <laughs> now there's so much in there, isn't there? Firstly, he's acknowledging the complete divinity of uh, Lehi Mahashai in such a lovely way. Again, the illuminator of the cosmos is within you. I, the, the sun of the suns. <laughs> is within you and then a really lovely play on the words because before he says uh you know these eyes have not glimpsed the sun and then he's saying that you know the sun's i want to see the sun's lesser glow so he's comparing the illuminator of cosmos which is lehi Mahashai, but he's acknowledging that seeing the sun is much much inferior much grosser to the, the cosmos lauren I also love how he approaches him and prays. It's like how we are taught to pray, not as a beggar, but as a child of God. His own divine birthright is to be able to see. 
and that that's how it like, how it feels it doesn't feel as if he's coming from a place of lack if anything it feels like he's coming from that super abundance which is again i feel like there's so many lessons in so many subtle ways in this book it's brilliant um so yeah it's definitely something we can take away indeed ravel lady Masai says someone has connived to put me in a difficult position he, and lady Masai says he has no healing power which is uh kind of knocks you back a bit isn't it considering by this time in chapter four you've you've read a lot of the you know the miraculous capabilities of uh Lahiri Mahasha. and uh indeed later in the book there, there's a chapter called the law of miracles uh chapter 30 um and here he's saying he's effectively kind of, kind of contradicting that and saying i have no healing power it leaves you uh questioning what you've understood so far in the book doesn't it but uh, Ramu almost like plays plays into Lahiri Mahasha's hand. It's like they were they were working together and having the most perfect dialogue. And he says, uh, "Sir, the Infinite One within you can certainly heal," <laughs> and that is obviously completely irrefutable uh, statement there, Lauren. Mm, it's so telling, isn't it? And again, that's a lesson for us, those of us who are questioning. Well surely it's it's him who has the power well it's not it's god flowing through him not that lahiri mahashai has the healing power no of course not he's the channel um and it's said so brilliantly there i think mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what uh, lahiri Mahasha confirms in the next paragraph mm -hmm. which he says god's power is limitless and then we have another play on the whole stars and the sun a cosmic illuminator paradigm where he says he who ignites the stars and the cells of flesh with mysterious life effulgence can surely bring the luster of vision into your eyes <laughs> what a what a group of, <laughs> that is just masterful english isn't it but chris you're muted we we saw in the last part uh that, that we covered in the last episode a lot of poetic uh, and, and beautiful, like outpouring of, of language uh, from Yogananda about Lahiri Mahasaya and, 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 and others. And it's a continuation on, on this chapter, isn't it? Really, it's like a showcase of, you know, how Yogananda uh, talks and his skills of oration. Um, I, I wondered if you guys think that, you know, with the advancement of spiritual um, perceptions and, and abilities, is there an advancement of like poetic ability in some sense art art artistry in a sense as well because that's kind of what we're seeing here nick i honestly i i really don't want to be a wet towel but intuitively i want to say my answer is no <laughs> yeah that's because... that's rather, that's amazing coming from your art major background and passion yeah it's it's because you know i feel like words are the most base elemental way of expression and i feel like as we go higher and higher words are going to be limiting words are going to be almost like a cage because as we get higher there's way more way for us to see we can get into clairvoyance clairsentience clair like you know listening to stuff as we get you know like in the old sound like okay okay i don't know i don't know i i don't i don't consider myself um an advanced meditator at all but if i ever get the chance to experience the own ocean no words can help me put that into you know an experience you know it's like guruji says that you know you have to feel these miracles on the inside right instead of trying to comprehend it in the three-dimensional um limbic essence so. I, I like that and I, pre I appreciate if i'm going to appreciate someone's opinion on this you know somebody who's who's in there doing it and done that and sees it I, I suppose i actually this is maybe ironic but i actually meant it in a different way <laughs> um i meant more so with the likes of yogananda and others who have achieved this you know great you know spiritual um ascent 
they seem to have a poetic way of being able to communicate. Like it seems you listen to the great, you know, the great souls. They have this way of translating this complex idea of you know emotions and thoughts in such simple ways. You know, and that's sort of where I was angling at, you know, for the superior, you know, individuals that we're talking about, Yogananda and such, um, that have achieved this spiritual grandeur. They seem to have this beautiful poetic way, but maybe I'm just cherry picking memory. I don't know. <laughs> well, I will in that case, I actually want to bring um uh, bring up the Tao, the Tao by Lao Tzu. Um, you know, where you know it's not it's not a yoga it's not related to um yogananda's works however um there is i don't know if you guys have read that it's a little book of um chinese philosophy and um it's very poetic and i've noticed that also the holy science it's a short book it's spoken in tongues and um i feel like there's so many layers each time you read something that beautiful that 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 poetic terrible or sentence I feel like you look at it with with the you look at it with its multi-dimensionality you know like each word stands out differently with each emotion that you feel every time you read it so you know I feel like these <laughs> beings you know I I can say yes and no based on you know the context and now I'm saying yes <laughs> <laughs> because if you look at it in this perspective, there's so many layers with this with, with, with this poetic nature that every time you read it, you get something new. So mm. I feel like it's the gift that keeps on giving. Mm. I also feel like, in answer to your question, Chris, in some ways, perhaps, yes, and we can even bring it down to our own level of limited consciousness just speaking for myself here but I remember when I remember hearing a story and it was from a, a devotee that a monk was speaking about and uh, she was basically saying that as she progressed on her journey towards God and, and going with Guruji's teachings and so on and so forth that the way she expressed herself through language had begun to change and that people at her work were starting to notice and sort of like pick up on it and be a bit funny so I think even in the subtlest ways it does change our expression through language on on as we journey because it starts to become less of us and more of he um, so food for thought yeah that that's I suppose the kind of angle that, that I was taking it at which was i think the more love outpouring there seems to be especially from yogananda he, he talked very much that way didn't he is that because you have that within you mm -hmm. so by that sense then your communication would change you know you have more love within you then you express that you know differently um so that yeah very very nice very nice um there's i can tell you there's um in if we relate English to mathematics for a very brief minute, there's spot the engineer. <laughs> <laughs> there's you can write if you if you come up with a theory, uh, you can write it in um, in a, ten pages of you know calculations and der derivations and all that kind of stuff, or you can deduce you can make all of that wrap it up in a couple of terms. And write something like e equals mc squared, which you know is three three variables there, and it explains the whole cosmos. So Einstein was capable capable of doing this, and Yogananda in English is certainly capable of doing it. And I'm not saying Einstein is you know spiritually as advanced as Yogananda, but mathematically he's done something that Yogananda does in what he does with his words and what the sages of you know the saints or the masters of old in India did with the power of sound through mantra. And you know, Niriksha mentioned the Ulm technique and that's you know three three syllables there, you know, three sounds. And again that three variables basically covers the whole of the vibratory creation. So there is a there is a skill and an art and it seems to be certainly related to the most profound uh, aspects of discovery and our existence. 
but uh, yeah, let's carry on with the story before we get too far down the rabbit hole, <laughs> if we're not there already. Um, so yes, so Lady Masha is saying that is different, you know, he explains the uh, life effulgence, the lustre of vision into his eyes, Ramu's eyes, and then Lady Masha touches Ramu's forehead at the point between the eyebrows, which is uh, now becoming a very common theme, and it is certainly a common theme in uh, in our path. Uh, Yogananda in the in the footnote describes this point as the spiritual eye or the single eye, and it, for no real reason at all, actually, other than put the seed into your mind. He says, at death, the consciousness of man is usually drawn to this holy spot, accounting for the upraised eyes found in the dead. Because here we weren't really talking about anything to do with death, but just the spiritual eye. Um, so I found that um, interesting that he's just inserted it into here um, without uh, very much context, really. Um, but uh, later on, we're obviously going to have a chapter about, you know, raising the dead um, and uh, other instances of death as well. Chris? Yeah, there's probably other examples in there that you could give as well that we all can relate to, right? Um, um, one for me that's very relatable is the classic Om Mana, you know, filling uh, signs that we have in sentences when we're trying to think. And usually they might come accompanied with looking towards the point between the eyebrows. So you'd say, oh, mm, you'd look yeah. towards the sky. And I, it's kind of funny that, isn't it? Because that's what we do in meditation. We chant, oh, <laughs> look there. And yet so many people do that unknowingly every day when you're you're seeking inspiration and, and guidance, you know, for, for a thought to come to you, whatever it might be. Uh, we see it every single day, don't we? It seems even when uh, um, unexplainable things happen, like when you faint, your eyes <laughs> seem to go <laughs> half closed and up to that point. I remember my, my sister once fainted and um, literally that's what happened. Her eyes were right there. And uh, in another, uh, so not another circumstance, you may be thinking she's in samadhi, but no. It's uh, unconscious. <laughs> it's not a conscious state <laughs> or mental chloroform, as Guruji describes in his poem, the Samadhi. Um, so yeah, so that's the point within the eyebrows. And then he tells him to keep your point, keep your concentration there and frequently chant the, the name of the prophet Ram for seven days. Uh, Chris. Priyank. Do you think, as an engineer, you would accept frequently as an instruction? Or would you say, okay, I need to know exactly how many times, <laughs> exactly when, you know, I, you know, it's a mathematical precision. Because for me, when I read it, I was like, frequently? Like, what, what do you mean frequently? <laughs> My little ego, you know, mind started ch chatting away to me like, is frequently like every R? You know, or you know, is that is that explicit enough for you? <laughs> do you think? There's um there's certain sadhana that um they only say Ram. Those are the only words that will come out of their mouth. You know, if you, if you want someone to you call someone, you just call them Ram. If you want them to go away, you'll say Ram. You'll say hello. You'll say Ram. Say goodbye. You'll say Ram. So there's certain sadhana that's that's the only syllables that will come out, and obviously Ram. Ram, you may have heard that sound has the word Om inside of it. So it's probably out of all the mantras, the most potent one next to the Om vibration. Um, and Ram here is, uh, you know, he refers to him as the holy, you know, the prophet Ram. Um, others others um, refer to him as an incarnation of God, Ram, uh, incarnation of Vishnu. A uh, very lovely story. I'd highly recommend that you uh, dip into the Ramayan. Um, you can get shortened versions of the story um, in there. And uh, it also explains, that epic also explains other figures um, in Hindu 
art and Hindu temples such as uh, um, Hanuman, the monkey, quote, monkey god that you see um, in, in Indian temples opposite uh, Ganapati or Ganesh, you'll have Hanuman on the opposite side of the dais as you, as you go into Indian temples. Vasa explains uh, some of his pastimes as well. Um, so yeah, so I'd, I'd recommend you browse through that book at to your leisure one day. So then Lehi Mahashai says another phenomenal phrase. He says, the splendor of the sun shall have a special dawn for you. Oh, wow. That is just stunning, isn't it? Is it? How long, it's like, how long can you stretch this whole sun and illumination thing? Like how many different beautiful ways you don't you wouldn't think there's that many different nuances to the sun but look at look at how many times how many ways Guruji's and uh, Lady Masha is changing this um, concept and making it like really deeper like if you didn't connect it to it on in the first time then certainly the second time and if not time third time <laughs> there's there's four or five different ways he does it it's just so beautiful the splendor of the sun shall have a special dawn for you and it's not necessary that he's just referring in this sentence to his vision, his ordinary physical vision. The special dawn he's, because here he's referring to the, the sadhana that he's given him, which is the Ram sadhana, you know, chant and recite the name Ram for seven days. But if you carry, the, essentially, if you carry on, you know, the, the ultimate realization, essentially the special dawn, will be uh, will be yours to to witness which is a beautiful beautiful thought and then yeah so then he does so he practices practices that for a week and then ramu beheld the fair face of nature again really beautiful language there and the reason that um, Lady Mahasha describes the next sentence, chose Ram as the mantra for Ramu, because Ramu was no doubt uh, named after the, the god Ram. So his family, no doubt, were devotees of Ram, uh, as many are in India. And therefore, he would have connected most to him. And Lady Mahasha is says above all other saints you know and that is why he chose but equally you could have chosen any uh you know name or god that uh, a devotee is uh, uh affiliate you know prone to worship or likes to think of as the personification of god or the conception of god nick, nick what do you think i this honestly the sentence just I want to say it cracked me up because the moment it said it, I was like, okay, this is the cosmic joke right here. Like, this is the, this is the epitome of the cosmic joke because imagine being born with that name and um, having, I don't know, I feel like it's an allusion to Ramu's own divinity, you know, like, like, because if Ramu, if, if the conscious, if, 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 if God consciousness did not come down as, Ramu to experience his life to then be connected back with the word Ram, the story would have never happened. Very, very, very good point. <laughs> and he therefore, therefore had the key from his birth, just his own name. Yeah, he was <laughs> his own key. It's, that's the cosmic joke right there. <laughs> yes, um, Chris. Yeah, I, I think you're probably pretty spot on there. It's it is quite the coincidences of, of life right um yeah the ability to relate and connect is kind of what i take away from this part of the chapter because at at the beginning we see here that uh he, he goes to the hearing my shy and the hearing my shy kind of rebukes him a little bit and it pushes him back like you know i someone's kind of pulling your leg you know i i can't do that um and to me it, it's like a test of willingness. How willing are you to do that, uh, to do this task? Um, because if we think about it, like God 
and therefore Mihir and Aishai would have known that he would maybe want that at some point. So he could have already kind of healed him ahead of time without him asking. Um, but but he didn't because it wasn't the right time and he had to go and ask for that specifically. So uh, to me, what I take away from this is how willing are you to do the work and how willing are you to, to go after certain aspects of, of change in your life? Because that makes all the difference. Mm, indeed, because it's, if, you know, if frequently, you know, if we define frequently to be just that's the only word that you say, mm. then that's a serious undertaking, isn't it? <laughs> As Chris said, we don't know what is meant by frequently, but Ramul could have taken it mm. very seriously. And that could have been, the you know, his every waking second, he could have been reciting it. And uh, that could have been the key to his cure from day one, but he only just had the intensity and the belief now. Um, what do you think, Lauren? Well, I was going to go off on a little bit of a tangent. Just, I had a curious pondering of, I wonder how long his sight remained for. If it was forever, just for one time. He doesn't specify the time in which he would like to experience the sun's lesser glow. <laughs> <laughs> and if you know we should be specific with our prayers um i don't know if anyone remembers the story of um i can't remember the title but guruji tells about um the, the man who keeps wishing for for something else and then he gets reincarnated again and again because he's not being specific enough and and uh, with his wishes to god uh, until eventually he says no god i just want you and that's it but yeah i was just curious um the answers aren't here but yeah. the, the devil is in the details <laughs> um, but uh, you know i'm going to put my money um behind you know lahiri mashai is giving them giving them the gift i don't mm. think it's retracted uh, a gift such, such, such as that it would be incredibly cruel you know um do you guys think that it says here, later in my shy, he actually touched the forehead. So he, phys he physically touched the forehead. He didn't need to do that, did he? He could have simply said, you know, put your eye, you know, focus the eyes between the forehead. I don't think he needed to touch him. I just wondered, is that a sort of stealthy way of putting the blessing and the healing work or beginning, beginning the healing work for Rami to kick, kick him off? Give him a head start. Nick? Man, you can literally say head start with that one. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, I'm gonna I'm actually gonna go quote the um the the second coming of Christ actually, because remember when Jesus said, like, oh you you you, you expect to see miracles first, and can you believe in God? Um, and I feel like this small gesture actually is um this small gesture actually kind of shows like hey this is this is really happening in the physical so i'm going to touch a part of your physical being to it's kind of like a psychosomatic connection where the, the body does remember you know the body does keep memory so when um i was going somewhere with this i, I promise but i just wanted to make a connection like how when you when you see something in the physical, you have to make a connection with it in the spiritual world. So, yeah. I'll make the connection for you, Nuriksha, because yes. uh, it was uh, definitely um, intentional, shall we say. Um, and because in chapter 32, uh, where Rama is raised from the dead and Lehi Mahashai raises Rama from the dead in front of Sri Yukteswar's very presence, he tells Sri Yukteswar to take a a drop of the oil from the, the candle, uh, the castor oil. And he said, put seven drops of this oil into Rama's, Rama's uh, mouth and he'll rise. And Sri Yukteswar came back and he said, you know, why the, why the oil? And uh, Lady Marsh said, uh, the oil served no special purpose, but you expected something tangible and physical, and hence 
I gave, I just used anything that was at my disposal. And there, therein lies the thing. So Ramu um, and us, for example, we knew, we, we, as Nuriksha said, we knew, we accept you see signs and wonders. You know? <laughs> our, our eyes are not yet open to see things without seeing the physical. <laughs> We're not yet able to see all the subtle uh, mm. realms, shall we say. So uh, that was nice. And then, um, so yeah, so that's why Lady Masha also chose Ram. You know, he could have chosen Krishna, he could have chosen Christ, Shiva, Hanuman, anyone. Um, but he chose the god that Ram, Rama, or Ramu had uh, worshipped since you know since he was a youth, probably. Um, and that's again, it's the beauty of the self-realization fellowship path, isn't it? Any form of God. Or divinity that you yourself are most in tune with that's the one that guruji allows you to uh, place on your altar whether it's the heavenly father or god you know the divine mother or whether it's light or whether it's none of those things it doesn't matter it's a, it's a personal uh, experience and that's uh, very unique shall we say to our path isn't it um, and it's the essence really of of um, hinduism and the eastern eastern philosophy actually so we're blessed to have it, shall we say. So, Lauren? That was accidental. Accidental. Ram. The next line is very beautiful. Again, Ramu's faith was the devotionally plowed soil in which the Guru's powerful seed of permanent healing sprouted. Very nice. Lauren? And that answers the curiosity, doesn't it? Permanent healing. Oh yeah. The truth is in the details. <laughs> I promise all of you I have read this many times. <laughs> this is why Lauren, this is why Nirikshaw doesn't bother going read it cover cover because she knows this is what happens to the best of us. Exactly. <laughs> right, hey. don't, don't worry, nobody corrected you. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. We've God already... corrected me. He let me see it and I thought, aha. But you know, it's good because it goes to show us that it's easy to jump into a line of questioning before you've fully understood or fully even taken in the detail. So I take Lauren. the lesson. Thank you. Lauren, if you start going down that path, this this podcast will uh, become redundant because then we won't have anything to say ever. <laughs> <laughs> For example, all four of us are looking at this card with this reading and I've put in bold permanently, but none of us, neither of us mm. looked at that word when Lauren raised this question, <laughs> which is classic. Um, but yeah, this uh, devotionally plowed soil which is uh, the type of soil that we all wish to uh, plow in our own minds or have in our own minds. You know, that uh, very potent uh, soil with lots of uh, good goodness in it. That's any seed can germinate, shall we say. It's very beautifully put. And then after reciting that story, Gibbananda was silent for a moment. And this is a recurring theme. Swami Pranabhananda, when he related his story about Lahiri Mahashai, he again was silent for a moment. And, you know, Guruji is slowly planting us, you know, this, this other seed of the importance of silence or retreating into the silence, whether that's in meditation or in every day or every walk of life, as every moment is better for the manifestation of silence, isn't it? Or stillness. So I thought that was... Uh, really nicely inserted uh, sentence there and also really nice for Gabriel Nanda to appreciate the blessings that he's had in in you know in being in such proximity of, of a great one as as Lahiri Mahashai so that is that and then he pays one more tribute to Lahiri Mahashai he says, um, he essentially says that all the miracles that uh, Lehi Mahashai performed, he never let the ego consciousness um, consider itself as the cause. Uh, and then he says the ego principle, and then there's a footnote, which is that the ego principle in Sanskrit is ahamkara, which in 
which in which in it means I do. And apparently it's the root cause of dualism or the seeming separation between man and his creator. Ahamkara brings human beings under the sway of Maya, cosmic delusion, by which the subject, the ego, falsely appears as object. The creatures imagine themselves to be the creators. So that is uh, something we should watch out for. <laughs> dualism, though, the concept of dualism um, is uh, is quite nicely displayed in the life of Jesus. Um, people in Christianity debate, you know, whether he was human or whether it was, he was divine. Was he born human and became divine? Was he always divine? There's that human divine element and uh, people debate it. But tackling the ego is something that uh, we have to do. And Guruji has also given us other prayers and affirmations to help us do that. You know, things like uh, thou art the doer, not I, or thy will be done, not mine. And then if we really take those affirmations to be true, then uh, you know the separation between us and the divine becomes hopefully less, less and less and uh, we can be at one with it one glorious day. <clears throat> so then he, then the Lady Masha, then um, Shasti Masha says, by the perfection of his surrender to the prime healing power, the master enabled it to flow freely through him which is nice and then we've got more gems of english and this time hope shall we say for us generations and to come um and it this should give you a lot of comfort shall we say the, the words are the numerous bodies that were spectacularly healed through lady marshai eventually had to feed the flames of cremation but the silent spiritual awakenings he affected, the Christ-like disciples he fashioned, are his imperishable miracles, of which we uh, are benefiting to this day, shall we say, um, and probably the reason why we're doing this podcast, probably the reason why, listeners, you are listening to this podcast, and hopefully, you know, it's an inspiration to all of us, such as the autobiography of a yogi is, and all the yogis that are included in the autobiography of a yogi that Lady Mahashai fashioned. Um, uh, you know, it's such a poetic way of dealing with death as well, isn't it? The numerous bodies that were spectacularly healed through Lady Mahashai eventually had to feed the flames of cremation. It's, uh, you know, the beginning of the end, uh, the beginning and the end are, you know, known to us, aren't they? But uh, what we do in the middle is what's uh, important. important. Um, and then he ends with, I never became a Sanskrit scholar, Mukunda speaking. Gebelananda taught me a diviner syntax. Really nice. Diviner syntax. There. What a uh, beautiful <laughs> combination of words, <laughs> Niriksha. Oh my god, this immediately brings me into programming. Yeah, oh exactly. My I was like, oh my god, he taught him how to code. <laughs> um, that was my first line when I read that. I was like, okay. Um, the taught Makunda how to basically code in Sanskrit, which honestly, I found out that Sanskrit is the only language that computers can understand. Um, fun fact, random fact too. Um, but don't fact check me i could be it still needs to be speculated but this sentence is so powerful because it shows how it shows the liquidity of, of sanskrit and how malleable and how um how it's literally a building block of sounds and syllables to form all these poetic revelations that we receive through the scripture so just wanted to share my excitement with that <laughs> Yes. I can I can fact check you in real time uh, on on the Sanskrit and the computer language. Apparently, according to Google, or not so much Google Analytics Insight.net, Sanskrit, an ancient Hindu language, is thought by NASA to be the best language for creating computer code 
for their artificial intelligence program, something along those oh. lines. So I was right. <laughs> that is correct. And we've covered uh, we cover this partially in in that episode where we were talking about Sanskrit and the structure of the um, the the script and how vowels and consonants and sounds are formed for every sorry how the vowels are applied to every consonant and how that's just like the most mathematically precise way of doing language. Uh, again, back to the mathematics and engineering of it. But uh, yeah, that's probably why. It it is good good language rather than A B C D variables that uh, we currently use <laughs> for our coding. But um, so yeah, so it's a really beautiful uh, narration, isn't it? And a really beautiful experience that Swami Kevlananda has shared. And in another beautiful arc, um, Sastri Mahasha actually became a school teacher for Yogananda um in you know the, the ranji school that he established and the residents of the ashram apparently were elated to have the fortune of having him as the principal dharmacharya uh, dharma means uh, duty charya is uh, you know the d divine one or the path the path of duty so he's uh, he was a really good embodiment of of dharma and um from the uh, swami satyananda biography on um, Shastri Mahashaya or Swami Kevlananda. Uh, Niriksha, if you, if you want to uh, read out something. So I found something that, uh, you know, people refer to, uh, you know, how they came to experience Shastri Mahashaya. And it says, a certain highly educated luminary of the university, a proud youth who had vowed that he would not lower his head to any person connected with religion or spirituality. We heard after he bowed at the feet of the egoless acharya, which means teacher, being in the presence of the person, the head bows by itself. Wow. <laughs> really nice. Um, I um, thought, thought to mention here, but when I had a boat with Barbara in, in London, uh, we called it joy so that you know you'd be enjoying when you're on it but um uh we uh we thought it was nice to have you know a little buddha on there is he going going back uh, some years that whenever you would go in to the boat you always had to bow your head to go into the boat to enter the boat <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i thought let's just throw a little story in there it's like a forced uh forced sadhana <laughs> people don't know, even know an atheist's worst nightmare <laughs> <laughs> atheist not welcome yeah you have to bow <laughs> um, and that uh, pretty much ends the uh, chapter but the there's another part of the footnote with the ahamkara section which is about uh, mr edwin arnold he was a literary magician, so we say, and he was very popular. And Yogananda quotes various parts of the um, Bhagavad Gita that were using Arnold's translation. And uh, Arnold, was, he had a very deep interest in Eastern philosophy, especially Buddhism. <clears throat> but he also translated the Bhagavad Gita, which he entitled The Song Celestial which is quite a nice uh, translation for the the book. Uh, sometimes, you know, mundane people would call it like the holy song, uh, the spiritual song, but this is a nice, nice way of uh, describing the title of the book. Um, so it is quite a famous translation, um, famous because of its, I think, because of its poetry. Uh, and uh, and the, the verses that, the, that he's, uh, used as an example here, I thought we'd just slightly just to take a couple of seconds to compare. Um, so the first one is, um, you know, uh, naught of myself I do, thus will he think, who holds the truth of truth, always assured, this is the sense world, plays with the senses. 
you have to read that many times to <laughs> understand, as with uh, some poetry. But Guruji in uh, the Yoga of the Bhagavad Gita uh, explains this or translates it is as the cognizer of truth united to God automatically perceives. I myself do nothing. Even though he sees, hears, touches, smells, eats, moves, sleeps, breathes, speaks, rejects, holds, opens or closes his eyes, realizing it is the senses activated by the nature that work amid sense objects. Again, this uh, is quite uh, a lot easier to read Yogananda's translations than Arnold's, but I dare say um, there'll be a lot of listeners that very much love Arnold <laughs> and his poetic style. Lauren, are you one of those, yes, one of those listeners? I am. What, uh, just reading this is just so divine. But like we were saying on another episode, I do tend to lean towards the kind of more ancient texts or those sort of poetic uh, leanings. But I, I love this whole, uh, whole verse. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, one other thing I'll, I'll read out, um, because he he um, he sometimes just adds one word that changes the whole meaning of the last six lines. So, for example, the, the, the one which is verse, uh, verse four, six is, um, albeit I, unborn, undying, indestructible, the Lord of all things, living, not the less. By Maya, by my magic, which I stamp on floating nature forms, the primal vast, I come and go and come. So that is the Arnold translation of that verse. And Guruji's translation, a lot simpler, is unborn though I am of changeless essence, yet becoming Lord of all creation, abiding in my own cosmic nature, Prakriti. I embody myself by self-evolved Maya delusion. Now, if 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 you if you read uh, uh, Arnold's translation, he says on the last line, on, float, on floating nature forms, the primal vast, I come and go and come. Now, if he hadn't added the last line, last word, and come, I come and go and come. Then it wouldn't have it wouldn't have made sense um, if you catch my drift, especially if you've got to the Bhagavad Gita as as Guruji has translated it in front of you. It's probably quite hard to imagine for listeners, but uh, if you did a deep dive into the analysis of the <laughs> of the way that the words have been uh, translated by each of the literary masters, shall we say, there's uh, certainly a very good touch uh, by Arnold and. Uh, Guruji makes it much simpler, shall we say. Lauren, I, I know you like Arnold, but um, are you, how long does it take you to understand an Arnold translation compared to a Guruji's translation? Just to grasp it as opposed to the deeper uh, concepts so that you have to meditate upon. I mean, being very honest, I have, this is the first time I ever read Arnold when we were preparing for this podcast. So I can't say for certain because I haven't read both works in full and mm. compared them. Oh. that's okay but the the style for me is very very challenging i oh. po i mean i um poetry and me have got a complex relationship <laughs> mm. even though guruji's work is poetry but uh yeah <laughs> it's tough it's very tough yeah i think what guruji does so well is that he takes any confusion that one may have and puts it in a way that cannot be misinterpreted and that's mm. the potency of Guruji what about when Guruji writes his poetry it's where you have to where you have to you know really meditate on each line each second line relating it to the first line and then by the third paragraph you're completely blissed out <laughs> for not not knowing what you read or what you understood but <laughs> blissed out so you're blissed out you're not confused yeah the goal. You, see? <laughs> the goal of you just know that you have to be a certain level of consciousness to truly know fully realize what he is saying but the intellect can actually 
start to grasp what he is saying mm. which some of these older texts they, they lose people and I think that's why uh, the world is quite lost <laughs> <laughs> to put it lightly indeed so thus ends chapter four it was a enjoyable chapter Lauren before we end it we have another four lines of the verse that we haven't read and I think oh. it's quite uplifting oh maybe I missed that might be please do lovely to read it it says hard it is to pierce that veil divine of various shows which hideth me yet they who worship me pierce it and pass beyond yes chapter chapter 7 verse 14 from the uh, Arnold translation there yes thank you very much um, I thought you meant from the main text I thought oh my gosh no. how have I missed a paragraph <laughs> what have I I need to sack myself um, from this podcast but uh, yes let's uh, end it end it on a note of reflection so chapter four was uh, a very good chapter of like a very beautiful way of narrating an action-packed sequence which was like interwoven with elements of comedy and drama and emotion you know, tears it had it seemed to have it all didn't it and somehow again Guruji brought it all together with more stories of Lehi Mahashai and his influence subtle and sometimes very obvious influences in his life through his disciples and how his disciples interacted with young Mukunda which is uh, gets more and more important um, and in chapter 32 um, Surya Kdeshwar tells Mukunda you know your since, since birth you know your your life has been uh, guided by basically disciples of Lahiri Mahashai and this is another example of that this the, um, guidance um, and I really I really liked our discussions this um, series this chapter on uh, how friendships can support or hinder you um, support you to grow spiritually or drag you backwards uh, perhaps um, but um, also how to deal with setbacks as Guruji did you know his moments of doubt um, and how faith and you know his resurrection of his faith shall we say lots there was lots of uh, mention of the Bhagavad Gita which I enjoyed um, you know young Magunda from memory just you know contradicting something the saint was that fake saint was saying uh, by quoting parts of the Bhagavad Gita and then here we ended with um, all the different verses that Guruji related to the Ahamkara or the ego principle which was nice to to look at the Gita in that way in terms of topics as opposed to the whole work which takes a lot of intellectual energy shall we say so the next chapter is on the tiger swami now this chapter is uh, oh no it's not it's on the perfume saint get it wrong a perfume saint displays his wonders that's the next chapter um and in that in that chapter we're gonna obviously delve deeper into uh that's a mysterious chapter to me because uh he kind of um, brings in this uh, saint and his miraculous powers of conjuring, conjuring up any scent or odor that uh, he pleased. And then uh, Mukunda essentially turning away from him, saying, you know, this is just a show of powers for the sake of acquiring powers of the supernatural as opposed to the real purpose, which is to find God. And uh, it's a quite a mysterious chapter in that way so i'm looking forward to taking the time to mm. uncode it um using uh, sanskrit coding hopefully nuiksha that nasa that nasa use so thanks uh, nick for joining us for the last couple of episodes um thank you chris chris had to disappear just now for a little while because he had a meeting but then that was the first ever occurrence i think that the women outnumbered the men that was two to one so maybe this is a shifting in this podcast <laughs> chris what were you saying sorry no no i, I need to go <laughs> oh you need to go <laughs> yeah, I was okay. off, but, uh, oh so no that day has not yet come 
that day has not yet come. One day, yeah. listeners, yeah. that'll be a glorious day. <laughs> 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 On that note, we shall see you next time. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Jai Guru. Thank you. Bye. Jai Guru.